Good evening. How are you? Well, it's uh, 88 degrees and uh, no wind, and the air quality index is a little uncomfortable, 65 or so. So, something to watch out for. There are a bunch of stories going on, but I have this feeling, I don't know if you share it, that recent events have made me feel like our ship of state is finding its even keel. That there are so many things happening, good things happening, that I think we're squeezing the minority among us who would destroy this nation as a democracy and a republic and replace it with the spontaneous, combustible autocracy that they prefer because they think somehow or other everybody's going to be punished for differing with them. And they have a horrendous set of personal choices that they call culture that we rightly call discrimination. So that's the context. Now, what does it mean if the ship of state is getting an even keel? It means that we are seeing prosecutions assembling themselves into a force that I think will crush Trump and his followers. After all, if it wasn't for the Electoral College, Trump would be a cipher and not possibly a threat to the country. But because of the bargain we made at the beginning of this nation, and that is to recognize their states with smaller populations, and we had to find some way to give them a seat at the table so they didn't feel that they were suppressed by others. And it wasn't exactly manufacturing versus slave-supported agriculture, but that was a drift. That was part of it. And so we had an electoral college. We had senators, which disproportionately give two votes in the Senate when sometimes there's only one congressman eligible to represent that district. So what do I see going forward? I'm not anxious about the charges. I think that when you have a narrative, the crimes identify themselves. And there's a feedback loop that I followed since I was a young prosecutor. And it goes like this. I have a narrative. It seems to be evil. After I write the narrative, I say to myself, well, what laws could apply? Is it a conspiracy? Is there two or more? Uh, what kind of crime is it? Is it interstate? Does it involve contraband, weapons, information, drugs? These are the things that you look at, and then you say, well, let's go look at that set of story, the narrative. And, oh, you know, maybe we don't have the element we need in this, quote, story that we're developing that fits the law. But at the end of the day, this back and forth determines the prosecution based on material facts that fit those sections and provisions of the federal code or, code or state code or local government. Now, people today are talking about, well, what can we charge them with? Well, the old standby is conspiracy. And it's a legitimate one here. A legitimate one. That is to say that Trump combined with others using false electors and claiming there had been fraud in the election, which wasn't true, and cooking up a cockamamie legal theory that was obviously untrue, trying to require the vice president to ignore the absent facts, that is to say that there was fraud in the election, and the crazy legal theory for which there was no standing in the Constitution, that is that the vice president could change the election uh, and send it back to be reconsidered by that board of phony electors, and 
thus take over the government. So, conspiracy, obviously, interfering with the business of Congress, fraud, misstatements. Uh, and you write it, you write it as a, as a story, but it's a true story. And you identify in paragraphs who's in this conspiracy. When two or more people make a criminal agreement, they're in a conspiracy. What's the value of a conspiracy? Well, if anybody makes a statement in furtherance of the conspiracy, it's admitted against everybody else. It's an exception to the hearsay rule. It's considered reliable. And you don't have to know that they're doing it when they do it, as long as it fits the means by which this conspiracy would be offered. And we can't ignore the fact that this case would be tried in D.C., and it's always possible to get a ringer. But I think it would be a fair in the sense that no one would think that they should be beholden to this president, former president. So am I less interested in the prosecution of Trump? No, I think we have to be vigilant to press forward. But I think we're in a different place than we've been for more than two years. And I think we're in shooting distance of winning the presidential race. And on that score, those of you out there who think the third party is the way to the great and good democracy we all yearn to have, you're being played for a fool. Because dislike them if you must, but you don't have dinner with them every night. Uh, and what are you upset about? They didn't press, in the case of Biden, he didn't press the prosecution of Trump sooner. I am a critique, a critic of just that aspect. I have plenty of things to say against Biden. And my wife Holly and I occasionally <laughs> disagree too. But there's no question in my mind that the no face, no name, no label, no issue, no nothing is gonna be where I put my vote. And if I did that, whose vote would that really be? It'd be a vote for Trump. In the close races in those states where electors matter, we would help him, and that's how he will use it. And all those people who are joining it, I'm sorry, gang, they're three-card Monty players, and they're not there for you. It's Jill Stein revisited. Bobby Kennedy is Jill Stein this election. Some of these other candidates, <laughs> Senator Munchen Manchin, he's another phony. You have to use your life's experience and your desire to win rightly for the right facts, for the right reasons, because that's the only way we restore our republic. Now, what other issues are there? I am upset about the borders question, but in a week or so, a federal judge is going to issue a decision about how Biden is handling that issue and frankly, I'm hoping he says he's got to do more. Spend some bucks, get some judges down there, get facilities. We're not the third world country. They're fleeing that. We're supposedly America. We can spend a fortune on war and we can't protect our borders by admitting those who in the history of our law and based on the facts we have helped and provided asylum to people as these who are coming to our borders. It's despicable. So I hope the judge makes the right decision. Uh, I think it's amusing <laughs> that Putin is not going to South Africa because <laughs> they might arrest him there as a war criminal. I think that's sweet. We uh, have another story it really bothers me, and it's about overdose deaths in America. And we immediately think the solution is more criminal enforcement. Huh. To a hammer, everything's a nail. And 
we have such stupid people writing laws. Because if you tell the average voter, if we just prosecute them more and hurt them more, drive them from the streets, we won't have overdoses. But we have overdoses for a lot of reasons. I am handling a federal case on appeal in the D.C. Circuit Court. And one of my clients just died. She died because she couldn't get the medication to deal with her pain. And well, how did that happen? The DEA came to her doctor's office and said, we think that you're creating a public emergency the way you administer pain medication. So we're pulling your license without any proof. We're just stopping it. We're not giving you a hearing. We're just telling you that we're doing that, and that's the way it's going to be. And so immediately, these patients were thrown on the street. And I have represented a bunch of them. And we have lost three now since I began representing them. And if uh, an ordinary doctor wants to, uh, well, ask a patient to move on, he has to give them 30 days. He has to help them find somebody who can give them the medication. When the government does it, it violates this legal provision. And I think every state and cast them on the street. And because the government, in its stupidity, thinks that if you take a pain medication, you're really addicted instead of you're trying to salve the pain that you have. We're not talking about acute pain you got playing basketball. We're talking about something that's lifelong and critical and somewhere from 7 to 10 on a scale of 10 being the most severe. And so the government finds it easy to say, ah, there are all these drugs out there. Well, we have a high demand in America, and some of those people demanding it are not able to get legitimate medication. They self-medicate, and as a result... They get to a point where, when that doesn't work, they kill themselves. So how much of the suicides account for those people who, quote, overdosed? Our government is so stupid when it comes to science. I don't care who is in the White House. And that includes uh, the environment, although we have a better environmental president than we have had. We do, stu we do stupid things, you know, opening up oil fields and allowing for crude oil to go in pipelines across America where we have amazing amounts of water at a time when we're compromised in the full supply. So that's, uh, that's my thing about that, overdose deaths. The uh, uh, Maine has done something interesting. Basically, a woman has full choice in the state. Absolutely. And uh, I say it because I like going up there and uh, I haven't been there in the deep winter, but the rest of the year it's really beautiful up there. And the government has decided sort of to respect the individual to know what's best for him or her. So I like that. Now, in the environment, we have another challenge on the corporate level. We were improving, you know, zero footprint, uh, different kinds of programs to minimize global warming. And now there's such a pushback from the morons among us, the suicidal right-wing extremists that see a conspiracy in the best of policies for the country. And so what they're calling it is green hushings. If a corporation is doing something to help the environment, they don't talk about it publicly. Because if they do, they'll suffer. There'll be people not buying their stuff who are equivalently related to the morons, the ignoble, the ones who compromise their own families and children by ignoring policies that matter to them 
because the only thing that matters to them is discrimination. And the grand secret conspiracy they believe is everywhere trying to get them and to get their leader, Trump. So that's what uh, I'm thinking about this day on the trail. <laughs> so I hope you have a good day and I'll try to see you tomorrow. All the best from the <laughs> Cathedral of Trees. Bye-bye.